Welcome, everyone. It's time for yet another webinar. Uh, this time, we're doing another one of our more technical webinars, which are now getting quite numerous. We've had a good run of people explaining different aspects of automation to support open source management, whether it's compliance or security. Today's webinar is a little bit special. Um, we have a webinar covering end-to-end -end SCA, so both using open source code and open data to create a solution. So this is about, about code and beyond. Um, and our presenter, as you will see in a minute, is someone well positioned to explain how an open source and open data solution offers the type of SCA that people need for modern professional open source management, modern professional software composition analysis, and why it being open is very important indeed. Before we get started, I will show our antitrust policy notice. As usual, you'll find the full antitrust policy on the Linux Foundation website. And if you're from a member company, you can ask questions of our council and the up to grow. Now, I mentioned our presenter today knows a little bit about about code, um, and and that's because he's the person behind it. So we have Philip back again, who has now done a series of webinars for us, uh, contributing a great deal of knowledge to our community. Um, last time, I believe, was the FOSDEM recap, which is now becoming an annual event for us. This time, we're zooming into the business domain as such, talking directly about the code that he's a maintainer of. So Philip is the CTO of Nexby, and he maintains about code, scan code, Deja code, and vulnerable code. As you'll find out in this presentation, that means a lot of important solutions which can be combined, used together to solve for the question of how do I do automation? And especially to solve for the question of how can I do automation for open source using open source and, of course, open data? Without further ado, it's not my job to steal Philippe's thunder. It's my job to hand over to him and to allow him to conduct his presentation. Over to you, Philippe, and the screen sharing is yours. Great. Thank you. Let me share this. And you should be able to see my screen now. Yes, it's looking great. Good, good. Yeah, I don't have a direct back channel. I, I don't know how we can actually present and participate in chat at the same time yet. Uh, so, I'll present today about, about code. Uh, which is a suite of open source projects. Um, one of the most well-known and popular one is, Vom, is uh, Scan Code. I I won't bother you too much with the, the details. Just an overview. Uh, the slides have much details about the different features, uh, and I'd like to focus a bit on uh, what's going up next in terms of uh, roadmap a new project, and then take questions. Um, so quick words about me. I, I was just realizing a couple of days ago that I'm pretty bad about uh, making predictions. Um, I have a good friend who was an early investor in a company called Dot Cloud, And he was asking me, hey, you know, I have this French guys here and investing some money with them. What do you think of it? Can you can you check them out and tell me what you think? I look at that and says, they will never go anywhere. I mean, it is yet another pass and there's bad enough of them in the market. And the, the company eventually changed their name to Docker. And of course, the technology was widely successful. So I'm not very good at that. Uh, I'm very good at deleting code commands and license commands in the kernel. Uh, I've deleted a lot of them there. Quick words about, about code and NextB. So about code is an open source community that builds tools and, and provides open data. 
NextB is sponsoring this. Um, everything we do is open code and open data, so there's no, no gimmicks. We used to have one of our tools that was proprietary, but it's been made open source uh, late last year. Um, so I don't have any, any license to sell you. Uh, just use open source, and I think that's what you should do also. So software composition analysis, making sure we're, we're clear there. Um, you should all be very aware, aware of it, but just make sure we're on the same page. On same page. We're, we're talking about being able to identify where the code, especially third-party code, comes from. Whenever it's in a, a project, a product, a system, an application, a device. And, and that's the, the key, key, key for thing. The second thing is, of course, you want to make sure you're allowed to use it. So it's about licensing. And you want to identify eventually on a continuing basis whether there's known security issues or, or security bugs in each of these packages. Uh, eventually, you want to also uh, include other concerns like, you know, is a a third party or an open source project sustainable? Is it uh, well crafted, well designed, well coded? So anything about quality and a number of other things. And you would say that's something mostly for open source. Um, but um, the, the, the fact is that you should apply eventually the same standards if you're buying commercial software too, because uh, especially in the world of startup, there's been a huge amount of cash invested by venture capitalists over the last several years in, in software, in this space, but in other space. And we're starting to see now a lot of road kills. So you may uh, buy commercial software, but you've not done all the due diligence and, and the long-term sustainability of this uh, proprietary software is probably uh, more dangerous and more fragile than, than it is with open source, where by definition, you should be able to carry on with the source uh, if the project was able to uh, falter. One thing I want to make sure you understand is that because of the volume of software we use, the security problems, the upcoming regulations, regulatory, regulatory uh, constraints, both in the US and, and Europe. Uh, this is a core competency. And we as developers used to treat that a bit like uh, something which was an easy thing to for us to acquire and, and include dependencies in our software products. Um, understanding exactly what we did install, uh, how it's used, uh, is really becoming a core competency of any software development organization, which means eventually the, the discussion we have today uh, will be disappearing in the future because uh, that would be a, a core process with core competency in, in every software team. Important is also its origin started with origin and there's been a lot of focus of licensing. It's about both. And I like to think it's really about being able to figure out where the code comes from first. Unfortunately, there's been a lot of focus mostly on security issues. And we see that the, the overall quality of license support, license detection quality on both commercial and open source is, is not really great. Um, and that's a problem. But the, 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 the thing is that I think we need to look at both in a holistic manner um, and try to reconcile the concerns of um, license from a legal point of view and uh, license, the, the security concerns from a volunteer's point of view are important. Even though you'll know it, I'm sure, if you're dealing with both in your in your group, they they're very separate 
they have very different concerns. Um, I think it's important as the, the gatekeepers of open source projects in your organization that you help converge these concerns of, of security and license. In the end, again, the core competency is about uh, figuring out where the code comes from. At some level, um, licensing security are just byproducts of, of knowing where the code comes from in most cases. There's been, as you, I'm sure you're, you're aware of a lot of uh, uh, interest and discussion around SBOMs and software composition analysis. And there's been a huge uh, uh, number of both projects and software companies uh, that have been created in the space. Um, you have to be extremely careful there because there's effectively a lot of projects. It's a bit like the wide, wide west and, and rush gold, rush, rush for the gold. Um, if you're buying commercial software, uh, make sure you do a very strong due diligence. If you're opening, if you're using open source tool, take the time to validate and, and review these in details. Um, and there's a serious problem here is that in most cases we, we have a sad situation where the data about open source packages is very often not open source itself. And I think it's wrong. I, I could understand to have a proprietary database about proprietary software. I have no problem with this. I think it's, it's sad that the, the data about open source packages, metadata, open source vulnerabilities is considered as a, a competitive advantage by uh, software companies in our space of software composition analysis. And um, the other thing you have to be careful is that there's a lot of vendors that tend to use open source as, as a marketing gimmick. And they will say, oh, but we, we do open source and look at this project. But very often they, they end up having uh, multi-tier licensing and you have a, a marketing uh, design open source tools with a lot of limitations. And, and so don't be fooled by that. Um, make sure that you understand very clearly the difference between what's open, what's not. And I think, again, uh, we should, as, as a community, focus on producing excellent open data that everybody can share and reuse when it comes to uh, open source package and vulnerabilities. Um, I was discussing a couple of weeks ago with a, a friend who works in a VC back startup in the space. And he was telling me, but oh, Philippe, but if, if we didn't do proprietary data, we wouldn't be able to make a living. And I have a lot of empathy for that, uh, that, that, that comment. Uh, they, they, they had received about $50 million of uh, this investment so far. And I don't think that's by creating proper data the time open source tool that's uh, a long-term, good, viable business model. Um, we want open data and take with a lot of uh, care and a lot of, uh, be, be extremely careful when you, you have vendors that say they have premium uh, data about open source, especially when it's premium data about vulnerabilities. Um, at some level, what's the difference between somebody that says, oh, I have premium vulnerability information on open source packages that I can sell to you for a fee and somebody that sells an exploit on the dark net. Um, the two are essentially similar. And if you don't want to condone the behavior of selling exploits, then you shouldn't condone buying proprietary data for open source package metadata vulnerabilities in particular. 
Okay, so there's there's a lot of tools in the space. We've discussed that, and and just want to to highlight why why we did create about code. Um, so to me, essential have both free and open source code and data, and apply open source tooling to open source problems. I have no qualms with applying proprietary source to proprietary problems. But I think it's important that for open source and free and open source software, we use free and open source, uh, both code and data. Um, we wanted also to make sure we could have eventually a, a, a holistic view that looks uh, at license packages and vulnerabilities. And a lot of you may know scan code uh, for its uh, prowess in license detection. But we, we started a vulnerability database, for instance, vulnerable code project in 2017. So it's not like something which is just popping out of the, the nowhere. Um, the other thing here is uh, we are trying to focus really on the low level uh, core code analysis problems. And we've designed this thing called PackageRail Perl uh, for use in scan code and vulnerable code originally. And it's the de facto standard package identifier throughout the industry today, which is awesome. Uh, I'll discuss it more in a, in a minute. It's awesome, but it's also, uh, unfortunately, uh, not perfect. And, and there's some work to be done to improve how uh, package URLs, identifiers can be used throughout as bombs and, and tools to, to enable true and seamless integration between tools and, and as bombs. Um, we, we initially were doing kind of one size fit all uh, code scanning, but we found out eventually that the the, the ability to have custom pipelines where you can fine tune to the specific context of tech stack, how you, you do the code analysis is, uh, is really important. Um, for instance, analyzing the binaries deployed uh, in a Java jar is fairly different from trying to analyze the minified binary or binary-like JavaScript uh, in, uh, in a Webpack uh, bundle. Conceptually, very similar thing. You have source code, you end up having some kind of binary-like uh, output. The techniques you go and you, you need to go through are very different. And having these pipelining capabilities, which is part of ScanCode.io, is really important. Of course, the fact that um, you have tools that work also from the command line that are reasonably easy to deploy makes it easy to have a decentralized approach. And it's very clear to me that what we see as a, as a, as a practice emerging in larger organizations is to have a combination of a centralized aggregation of the, the, the data you use, uh, in terms of policies and, and approved package license, which is defined centrally. And eventually, the scanning is then delegated to each, each of the product teams, each of the development team, each of the system teams, and aggregated centrally. And you have both uh, feedback from central policy declarations that's in the tools, as well as uh, central aggregation, so you can have uh, a more proactive policy and, and management by exception. Um, so that's that's a bit the the the, the key thing. Uh, the the other reason why we we create TID and create these tools is that the the state of uh, tooling the space is not great. It's and and when I say it's not great, it's a euphemism. It's it's pretty sad and pretty bad in many cases. We, we started originally scanned code more as a knee-jerk reaction to code snippet scanners, which were missing a great deal of uh, code. Um, 
Uh, but the, the state today is that uh, we still have many problems. We, we, we're, we're completing a large scale comparison of uh, several container scanners, both open source and commercials, and went in with uh, a lot of hubris saying, hey, that's going to be easy. We're going to just ask all of these vendors to produce an S bomb for a set of well-known container images, and we're going to do the same on open source tools. And then we're going to combine all that and be able to do fine grain comparison. In, that was the, the plan going in. Uh, it happens that it was fairly impossible to, to go uh, and do things so easily. Many commercial tools are making up packages there. Uh, I would say probably called that hallucination. So I'm pretty sure they don't use AI, or if they do, that's really, really a bad use of AI. So they're making up packages, missing packages. Uh, most of the time, they really only look at the install package database. And uh, the quality of both origin and license is, is bad, or in many cases, misleading. I found that several commercial tools are probably just doing a grab on the dictated license of, say, a Debian, uh, Debian copyright file. How I, I don't know their code, I know how they work, but just looking at the output, that's really what they do. And frankly, if you're if you're if you're paying for grab, you're you're doing the wrong thing. Well, you may want to pay the grab maintainers if you if you feel like it, but uh, buying. Um, commercial tool that just does grab. It's not, not, uh, not, not wonderful. We also have another issue beyond inconsistencies on, on package identifiers and pearls is uh, just plain invalid SBOM that are not just uh, compliant with the specs. And the specs can be complex. Um, here we were using uh, Cyclone DX. Uh, but we had tools that were just not very simply passing a basic schema validation. So that's why we decided and, and are working on a continuing basis to further this, this stack of tools. Um, maybe a quick, quick break if there's any question at this stage. I'm checking the chat very briefly. Okay, no, no questions at the, at the moment. One, two, three, four. All right, let me carry on then. So maybe very briefly, who is using it? And I, I would love to drop names there, but it's difficult because it's impossible for an open source project to get authorization to reuse the name of a company that's using their tool. Um, and I guess there's probably a lot of companies which are leaking or dropping names on their website without authorization. Um, I'm not like that. So what I can say is uh, information that's derived from public usage. And if, if it's private information, I can just uh, provide something which is a, a proxy for that. Um, if, if you are using some of our tools and are willing to just be used as a reference uh, or just having your name used as a reference, that would be wonderful. Uh, today, what we see is scan code is, is really considered in many cases as the, the, the best and leading tool for um, code origin and, and in particular license scanning. It's used and embedded in many open source tools like ORT, uh, Fossology, TURN, FOSLIGHT, and, and, and others. Um, package URL that started with uh, scan code and uh, vulnerable code is the de facto standard uh, in SBOM and VEX standard like CSCF to, to identify packages. Uh, so I can claim, and there's a bit of hubris there, that all open source SCA and most 
commercial and SBOM tools are using at some level uh, some of the technology we, we're built, whether it's uh, uh, scan code or, or in this case, package URL. It's a bit of a stretch, but that's true. Um, um, it's something that started there, so I have a small bragging right there. We, we organized the, the tool in three areas. SCA tools at the, at the left, which are the things that analyze the code. So the input is really a bunch of code files. And management apps are there to aggregate information. It's about data management policies. Uh, it's not about the code itself. And this is supported by a knowledge base. Um, and if we dive a bit deeper there, so on the left-hand side, being able to uh, do the software composition analysis, meaning scanning, like finding a license, a copyright, or matching, doing a lookup in the knowledge base for a code matching. So that speaks for itself. Find similar code that may exist elsewhere. And there's make many more things there in the realm of, uh, in particular, binary analysis and I'll come to some of the projects we're doing here. On the right-hand side, management apps, it's Deja code. And here you can define policies, you can manage your products, uh, what they're made of, uh, import and export SBOMs, uh, create custom reports, uh, workflows, approvals, um, LDAP integration, all the things you expect from an enterprise management application in the space. And which is interesting because uh, it's tightly and, and benefits from integration with scan code, but you can very much use it uh, as an integration platform, for instance, using SBOMs uh, from other tools which may have been created by any proprietary open source tools. At the bottom, knowledge base, and we have licenses. I like to think we have the largest uh, database of uh, software license on this side of the galaxy, which contains everything you have in, in SPDX, of course, plus everything that's not on SPDX, um, because SPDX is a policy, for instance, not to include proprietary license. We track proprietary license. We track also a lot of uh, less common open source license variations, uh, older license, newer license. It's, it's a very fast evolving uh, database. Um, and it's also backed by 30 or 40,000 samples of um, license notice, license text, uh, license reference, license URLs, and all that. So a lot of things which are then supporting the fine grain detection of, of open source license and proprietary license in, uh, in scan code. Then there's database of packages, which we call the Perl DB, uh, which contains normalized metadata about the files and the package they are part of. Uh, together with all the detailed scans and fingerprints which are supporting the, the code matching capabilities in, in uh, scan code and match code. And finally, a volunteer database, uh, which is interesting because it's, it's an aggregated volunteer database in the sense that we, we go and, and put together a bunch of uh, existing open data source What's interesting there is that we're tracking the license of each of these data sources. And I think until recently, nobody has ever done that seriously. So we've been pushing that a bit. I know, for instance, uh, uh, originally OSV, Google's OSV is, a, is another wrong database, didn't have a clear license information, and OSS first didn't have one. So we, we reported that eventually they, they came with a license, so that's good, but they're still a lot of data that is reused in the space and vulnerability data may have license. We asked 
for instance, the Ubuntu, the, the Debian team, what was the license of their vulnerabilities? And they said, oh, don't know, nobody ever asked us. Okay, uh, let me figure it out for you. Uh, that was a bit scary at first to think that everybody has been reusing the data and nobody ever questioned whether it was okay to reuse that data. Uh, and there's maybe folks that would say, oh, but you know, it's, it's just data and in the US, this is as, as original as a phone book and it's probably not copyrightable. But that's not my point there. Uh, I want to make sure I can reuse data that's well known. The other thing about vulnerable code that's important is that we, we work upstream as much as possible. And what I mean by working upstream is uh, working directly with the creators of uh, vulnerability data. For instance, we've been working recently with the maintainers of the GNU uh, C library, glibc, that recently became a CNA, meaning a, a CV numbering authority, meaning they can publish their own vulnerabilities to the US National Vulnerability Database and, and the CV program. And they were publishing advisories in a semi-structured format, which was, frankly, uh, impossible to parse. And so we worked with them to, to say, hey, you know, we have problem to parse that. Uh, uh, what does it mean? Help us. Eventually, they updated the format based on that. But here, and in a few other cases, what's somewhat troubling is that nobody ever asked them what the structure of the advisory database is. Or was uh, the same happened, for instance, with Nginx, where we did probably over two, two, three months back and forth with the Nginx maintainers. Nginx is a very widely used uh, web server, which is power, powering probably, I don't know, maybe a third uh, to two thirds of uh, the, the web server out there are based and, and running Nginx. Uh, and it took us two months to understand back and forth with the maintainers of Nginx what is the meaning of their advisories. They, they don't have a lot of security advisories, um, but still, it means that nobody ever asked them uh, or used the data because the data itself was uh, impossible to understand short of having the commentary we received from the maintainers. And obviously, this was not written down at the time. Um, so. It's important to go upstream and, and it's surprising and, and, and what we're doing is important in a way because it's surprising that nobody does that. Um, the important thing here is that vulnerabilities we provide here in contrast with uh, what you have in the raw vulnerability database like the MVD uh, is based on package URLs. And I say in contrast, but actually uh, last week or the week before, there was an announcement that the next version of the National Vanity Database CV format, um, version 5.1, is actually including package URLs. So eventually, and, and that's I'm perfectly OK with that, eventually it may mean that in the future, a couple of years from now, something like vulnerable code and our Vanity Database will be obsolete. Uh, but it will have had if that uh, comes to, to, to be the case, it will have had a pretty, pretty nice and, and important impact, both on other open source vulnerability database and, and reference database uh, like the NVD and the CBA program. For now, it's still, it's fairly useful and fairly unique in its space. And that's pretty much it. I'm going to tell you about the, the, the tools. You're welcome to have a, a deeper look, reach out. There's a lot of uh, extra bonus slides on the, the slide deck you will get from uh, uh, Shane. What I want to look now is very specifically at, at a few projects which are upcoming or in progress, which are fairly unique and different. So the first one is what we call back to source. And the idea of back to source is that you, you can trust but verify that a package binary 
is built from its source. Sounds pretty obvious, but hey, you know, uh, if you've heard about the exe issue uh, recently, and if you haven't, and you're working in, in uh, an interesting in open chain, you, you were probably living in a cave. Uh, the exe util issue was that somebody over the course of several years uh, did social engineering to progressively take control of releasing the code for a project called exe, which is a compression utility used in every Linux distro, used in the Linux kernel, used everywhere. And they were injecting malicious payloads in the test files that went unnoticed. And they eventually injected a script as part of the build, which would then reuse this malicious payload and uh, essentially try to compromise SSH, meaning SSH is the tool to do remote secure access to servers. It would have been a, a pretty cataclysmic if this whole uh, story would have been able to uh, come to fruition, because potentially every Linux distro, every servers in the world, every Linux kernel could have potentially been uh, impacted at some level. I like to brag about the fact that we've been able to detect with this back to source project, the fact that we had a malicious build script tagged as requiring review for exe. And using code published before exe uh, issues was announced. Uh, now in earnest, it's, it's tagging also 200 other problem, problematic files as requiring review, um, 2000, there's about 2,500 files overall in uh, the, the two source release of exe at, uh, at play. So it's far from perfect, uh, but I'm not sure there's many folks that can uh, say, we were able to detect the exe issue uh, before, uh, we scored published before it was, it was there. Now, we didn't run the tool in exe, so that's, that's, that's a moot point, uh, but the whole, purpose of this project is to be able to apply this uh, kind of analysis on a systematic basis. Meaning you will be able to run that as a check on each and every package that you consume before the fact. Um, and it can be an important component on, on overall software supply chain security assurance. You want to make sure that you have the source. Um, related problem, for instance, Uber jars. Uh, in the Java world, there's this thing where you can combine multiple Java package in a larger package called an Uber jar. And very often, information about what are these sub package, including the larger ones, are missing. So you have no information about license, no information about origin, meaning you're shipping non-compliant code and potentially vulnerable code. Uh, this is designed also to detect the fact that we have a piece of uh, a package that has missing source code because the source code of the third party bundle jars is usually not present. It's dynamically fetched at, uh, at build time. Uh, so that was one example. Uh, I'll go there in a second. Remember, it's all open source, so we need your support. Uh, but I would like to know, to discuss now about a few other roadmap items we're working on. Uh, a new project called Crevex. Uh, Crevex standing for CRA and VEX for, for VEX. Uh, the goal is to uh, create an app to automate vulnerabilities management. Uh, with a focus on, on small businesses and open source project as a start. Doesn't mean they cannot be used for larger organizations, just our initial focus is clearly, uh, uh, clearly there. And the difference is that a lot of the volunteer management applications that exist out there are centered on the concerns of a security team. Here, uh, we're trying to say, no, we, we have, product teams, software teams, um, 
very managing vulnerabilities is becoming an important thing. Good engineering business in general, but also regulatory requirements. And how can we help teams uh, better manage what's in their code? Is there known security issues? And deal with the volume, and in case, deluge of uh, vulnerabilities reports, so you can focus on the one that matter uh, without having to uh, boil the ocean and, or hire hundreds of people to, to be able to do this kind of thing. It's a web-based application. It's going to be based on Deja Code. It's a project that's been uh, um, that's funded in part actually by a, a grant from the European Union. And the whole point is to help uh, triage and automate these, these operations. You have less work to do. And you can focus not on uh, a wide good chase, uh, but just on the things that matter. And if you ever discuss with vulnerability researchers um, working in security teams, it's, it's tough to figure out what is the set of vulnerabilities you need to look at. Because there's a lot, and you need to determine, is this something that needs my attention now? So is there a fire in the house? Uh, uh, or uh, it's just some smoke and it can wait a bit? Uh, the difficulty is that, of course, there's always smoke and fire, and you, you, it's hard, it's hard to, to deal with. So what the project is going to do very simply is being able to import SBOM and scans, so you can aggregate them in one place, uh, schedule on a continuing basis lookups in the Vaunt database, so you have up-to-date information, and then integrate multiple scorings and, and rules and information from exploitability and reachability, I'll come that, uh, back that to a second, to understand if a vulnerability is really expressed or exploitable in the context of your app, uh, more likely than not, and how severe it is, and, and all this being a way to, to, again, rank and prioritize what you should look at first. And on the output side, you want to be able to produce SBOM, of course, but uh, more importantly, what's called VEX, so Volumity Exploitability Document. Uh, things like CSCF or the, the Cyclone DX, uh, VEX, SPEC, there's another project called OpenVEX. I think SPDX also has, uh, has an upcoming support for, for this kind of statements. The point is to be able to communicate to the rest of the world that uh, my product include this package, which has a known vulnerability, X, Y, Z. And this vulnerability is something that's potentially exploitable in your deployment. You should upgrade, here is a patch. Or we're not subject to this vulnerability uh, because of X, Y, and Z. That's what essentially VEX is about, is being able to attest whether a given vulnerability applies or not. Uh, it's important because there's uh, all these, uh, for instance, in the US, uh, there's very specific requirements that you could read as saying that any, any vulnerabilities above a certain uh, level of criticality uh, should be either patched or attested as uh, non-vulnerable. So lots of work ahead, especially in the context of uh, these regulations and the upcoming uh, CRA. Uh, that's why we call the project CRIVEX. The second project uh, coming on the heels of that, which is code reachability. And so what is reachability is to say, if I have, say, a, a non-vulnerability in OpenSSL 101G, and I know the segment of code in OpenSSL that is subject to the vulnerability. And I know potentially the fix, commit, and patch that fixes this vulnerability. So there's a lot of ifs there, right? Then I could analyze 
the code symbols, the code graph of OpenSSL, and how my application or the third party package I use call this OpenSSL code. And I could determine in a static fashion, or in some case in dynamic fashion, whether the code that's vulnerable is effectively used and whether someone is it exploitable. If it's not used, there's always possibilities that it's exploitable. And you didn't need to use the, the vulnerable code in Log4j to, to, to be exploited. Had, that was completely uh, separate. Um, but that's going to be an important triage factor to rank the, the different vulnerabilities and focus on the one that you know are really a fire in the house. Um, and so there's there's a few excellent tools in the space um, like uh, Eclipse Steady, uh, Yorn, actually, sorry, it's a typo, it's uh, J-O-E-R-N, Yorn, um, that we want to integrate, we want also to produce uh, wherever we can new complementary original new tools, especially uh, in the, the domain of symbol-based with reachability based on the, the features of binary analysis that we have. Um, and that's going to be an important complement to automate uh, and better determine whether a given vulnerability is likely to be exploitable. Again, lots of ifs there, lots of work to get something that works, um, you, you have a lot of commercial vendors that provide supposedly a, a perfect solution in the space um, that's uh, doing everything. Uh, I, it's hard to figure out whether they're actually doing anything good. Here we're building a bona fide open source solution to ensure that we can handle open source security vulnerabilities uh, with open source tools. Um, another new project, um, it's called Generated AI, AI Generated Code Search. Um, and the question is very simply, is it okay and safe to reuse AI generated code? It's a question many organizations are asking themselves nowadays. And a lot of uh, companies are coming with policies in the space. Uh, Sometimes it's okay, sometimes it's prohibited. Um, when it's okay, there's usually several, uh, several guardrails around uh, how it can be used. I think it can be a wonderful productivity booster. Personally, I don't use it and we don't use it on our projects. Uh, I find AI generated code to be something I'm fighting against more than helping me at the moment. Um, now, the, the, what, what's the problem? The problem is that if you do a small thought experiment, say you take a, a language model built only on GPL code, and you put generative AI on top, is the generated code derived from GPL license code? I tend to say, yes, of course it is. Uh, and, and so, if you expand that to uh, something much larger, is what are the licensing implications? It's, it's difficult. It could be uh, both licensing and some case security issue if you just reproduce verbatim uh, stupid and vulnerable code sections. Um, so there's, there's interesting work in the space, for instance, uh, Hugging Face as a project called Starcoder and big code, uh, where they've used a large swath of the software heritage uh, data set as an input to build a large language model for, um, for code. And they also did run scan code, which is awesome, on top of uh, almost all the code. I don't know why they said they, they run it on 96% of the code and 4% of the time they used, um, they did use uh, um, 
the GitHub licensee tool, uh, which has a lot of uh, problem with regards to accuracy detection. But uh, eventually, there's there's work taking place there to have uh, uh, models which are starting from well known provenance in terms of code and license. Um, it still not doesn't mean that you 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 won't have issues about uh, where the code com comes from and whether it's okay to reuse it. Uh, and there's plenty of questions whether these models and their outputs are even copyrightable. Uh, what I understand these days is that, as most of you say, the output may not be copyrightable, which is yet another issue if you're building copyrighted code uh, and you're building proprietary tool. If the code you create is not copyrightable, you're going to have a problem. But the same would apply to an open source project. If we're making code, and our copyright no longer applies. And the whole edifice of licensing around proprietary and open source is based on copyright, then we, we, we have some uh, interesting problem ahead of us. Uh, this is a project also that's partially funded by the uh, European Union, by the way. And in terms of how it's going to be uh, done, we, we initially did some research on trying to fight fire with fire. And so the idea is to say, if you use the code you analyze as a prompt to a generative AI and, and request the regeneration of the code, say you stop at each function or method boundaries, once you've provided the signatures and the, the doc string or Java doc for the, the method, say, hey, please uh, generate this code along these specs. Then you take the generated code and you compare it with your original code and, and, and see how similar they are. Uh, it actually is interestingly enough working in some case. But the problem is that it's completely impractical because it's way too slow and it costs an arm and leg uh, to, to do the analysis on any kind of a code base. Um, and the mere fact that there's similar code that's generated doesn't mean that it's absolutely clear that it was generated. It could be boilerplate code. And remember also that we've been generating code in IDEs, in development tools forever. Um, so the focus is more, more simply to, to build a code snippet matching engine, which has specific uh, uh, features that makes it better for AI generated code, which existing snippet code solution with their proprietary open source don't deal with. Um, so we can discuss that in more details, but I just go over that very quickly. Um, last thing I wanted to discuss today, there's a lot more, but uh, Container composition analysis is a mess. And that's a project I did. It's not a bona fide project yet. Um, and everybody thinks to put their head uh, in the sand there and uh, pretend that uh, there's no problem with container origin and the code that's in containers and, and Docker images and OCI images. And there's no problem with license. But the reality is that uh, based on, on the concrete, practical, data-driven uh, project we just did, it's, it's really plain bad. And so I think we can do better. And a project ID would be to ensure that we have at least a good hold on base images, because in most cases, software teams usually know well what they put in containers when it comes to their own code. At least there's good tooling that can help you do that. Um, but ensuring we have a good hold on, on the base images um, would be something that could be done as a community. And that's pretty much it. Um, I'll take questions now. Um, I'll just finish on this slide. So you have a few uh, pointers. Um, 
Go ahead. We have a few questions in the chat. Uh, one came from Marketon at uh, Nokia. He was just saying, can you provide your container scan comparison report? So and yes, yes, that's part. So, so it's, it's, it's been commissioned work that we did for a, a, a customer. Um, but part of the agreement is that we would produce a anonymized version uh, of the report. So anonymized meaning that, you know, maybe uh, the commercial tools will, won't be named. So if there's a tool called, I don't know, said Black Duck, maybe the report will say it's B. Something like that. So it will be anonymized to protect both the, the, the vendors. In many cases, you are not allowed to publish uh, benchmarks uh, on the tools, uh, commercial license, prohibitives in many cases. And second, uh, to make sure there's no proprietary data that exposed. Uh, but the gist and, and the essence will be there, yes. Uh, it's, it's really sad, and there's by the way on my side, so we created package URLs for scan code and Vombo code, and it's been really awakening to see that there's so much uh, uh, so much variation across tools on how they use package URLs. So that's another problem that that needs to be fixed. We need to uh, create some kind of registry and maybe publish that as part of the Perl DB. Uh, which would allow to ensure that when you have a package URL, it's it's actually something that exists, that is synthetically valid, and and it's not made up. Uh, I was really sad and, and and to see that there was so much invention on package URLs and package identifiers across tools, uh, because we are not able to 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 compare the things one to one until we were doing manual reviews, manual clear uh, cleaning and, and manual uh, enhancement of all these, uh, these, uh, these scans. I noticed that Mattia had said that he does have a, a bit of a comparison scan he made and uh, he, he can share that, though he noted that, yeah, same as you said, different tools mark things very differently. Um, yeah. Steve Kilbane said that your comment about small bragging rights is too humble, but NextB made a huge contribution through scan code and sends his thanks. Thank um, you. He does have a question. Yeah, see, you're not only famous, but appreciated. Um, he does have a question. He said in a previous webinar, you talked about working on new approaches to difference matching using mm -hmm. hashes that give closer hash values for minimal yes. changes. Yes. Um, and that's in order to match different versions of the same open source package. We just wanted to know, how did that go? So that's, 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 that's part of the, the, the project we're talking he, about here. Um, even though it's, it's not really about Gen AI code search. So it's, it's going, it's going, it's still ongoing. So this is starting the, the, the overall project on match code you were referencing to is still in progress. Um, and so there's, there's, there's really two sides. The first side is to be able to compare source and binaries. And the second one is to compare source to source and source evolution. Um, and, and one of the, there's, there's really two goals for to compare the source evolution. The first one is if I have version one and version two of the same package. And say I did a full scan and review and there were some, some quirks that need fixing on version one. The question is if I have version two, do I need to do the same extensive review? How and when can I carry around, carry forward uh, some of my initial work and how different, how similar is the code between version one and version two, which would allow me to say, it's okay to say version one of Bash is under the GPL and version 101, which has this tiny code changes, no copyright change, no license change, is still under the GPL and I can carry forward uh, my previous estimation. So there's that. The second one is the, the, the thing we discussed with Exe 
uh, to find discrepancies. And the last and third one is uh, to actually do snippet matching. So it's it's there, it's progressing uh, on a, a regular and steady pace. Uh, it's not finished. Other other questions? Oh yes, we do have another question. Uh, we have one in from Yari, and it's uh, a note that it would be nice to hear your thoughts about SWH ID and its relation to package URLs. Um, so uh, SWH ID for everybody to understand are the identifier used in software heritage which is a small petabyte scale uh, database of uh, free and open source software source code. Just a few petabytes. Uh, so nothing fairly big there. Uh, they, they specified an identifier to identify whole code trees or files exactly. You could think of the project as a giant Git repository. Um, it's actually literally a giant Git repository in a way, uh, stored in a, a very large Postgres database. Uh, this identifier is mostly a, a SHA-1 Git, meaning it's essentially the same as a blob SHA-1 uh, as using Git, except they specify it so uh, it's something that's stable for SWH for the long run. So. It's a checksum based on an exact file. You can eventually address a whole code tree the same way exactly. It's based on checking, uh, on hashing the content. So at some level, it's the same as a, as a exact code fingerprint. It's probably the best way to think of it, an exact code fingerprint. Uh, Perl, on the other hand, is, is about being able to say, oh, uh, I'm using package uh, uh, React from NPM version 2.3. Um, so very much higher level. Uh, the question is, how do you figure out uh, one or the other? So SWHID, you need to compute the hash on the file. A Perl, you observe based on package metadata. So you don't need to, to it's not strictly based on content, uh, but it's still based on package metadata. And it's just convention to have the same syntax used across all ecosystems. Um, so the two are eventually complementary in the sense that in most cases, as a developer, I cannot reason about uh, SHA-1 checksum. <laughs> it's too much in my head, it's 40, 40 characters of hexadecimal. I can easily say, oh, NPM uh, react at 1.2. That's something I, I know about, something I can think about, something I can talk about. So in, in that sense, both are, 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 are really complementary. When it comes to vulnerabilities and dependency management, you don't think about checksums. And uh, in as much as a lot of people that think you should sign cryptographically everything, uh, we're a very long way to be able to reap any benefits from that. And there's also a danger, uh, which is it brings a lot of uh, uh, rigidity in the overall software development process if, if everything is cryptographically signed. So, I hope that helps. And there was a question from, uh, uh, oh, we, we are losing, uh, we're losing Shane. There's a question from, uh, uh, yeah. So, uh, there's a question from Mark Etienne uh, about uh, comparison in uh, Docker containers. It's very hard to figure out what's wrong and not or not. And what we did in this, in the, in the context of this uh, specific container analysis was to establish a baseline 
meaning doing an extensive comprehensive audit of the container content the container composition in terms of all the package and license and, and reviewing this by hand uh, assisted by tools of course using scan code as a thing but also combining the results from other tools so we would get a full picture and then once having that being able to do a tool to tool comparison against the baseline and that was sad i mean frankly sad because it's it's all over the map so uh, uh, i i i mean we, we we're about to have a a deluge of s bombs coming our way uh, because that's the way and and uh, because of regulatory requirements and vendors will stop providing that an open source project will start providing that and it's it's going to be really interesting. So I hope we can prepare for that before it's it's too late. And to me, the the work on the on package URLs, homogenization, and avoiding too many funky stuff uh, is going to be useful. Um, there's a question from Stephen Kilbane about uh, about files. Um, so so just just so everybody understands what about files are about um i'm gonna take the example of scan code toolkit where um, we use a small set of files for instance here there's code in this file called pull.py, which I copied from some other place. And what about file says is very simply, this file pull.py, you know, that's the version from 2017. That's where it's from as a download URL. And it has this copyright, this license, and this notice. Uh, in this case, there were some issue about the the actual license there. So we reached out to the developers. It's pretty old actually in this case, but that's the fact it's old doesn't matter. We reached out to developers saying, hey, what's your license? And the point here is to record in the code base itself, uh, small tidbits of origin and license. Uh, you could think of it, I like to think of it as the missing package manifest for patch code or uh, for code that you vendor or code that doesn't come from a package registry. And say, uh, say you're doing embedded device development, C, C++. Um, even if some of you may be using tools like Conan, there's still a huge swath of code that usually is vendored and doesn't come from a, a, a third party. A repository like say npm or pypi or rubygen so that's a way to store this information side by side in the code base it's still alive and kicking i know it's used for instance by uh, libraries.io uh, i've been in discussion with the folks from fsfe uh, to to actually uh, come with the common standards because that's also a concern they were uh, looking at for the reuse project and again so it's a live kicking used uh, it's a way to store as i said missing package information and or curations um, in the code base so whenever you have these they 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 end up being very close to the code so we use a lot of these here in our code um, and um, it's otherwise pretty pretty used and pretty useful. So that's what I, pretty much what I would, uh, all, all there is to say about it. Um, I don't know if there's any other questions or you wanted to ask more about that, uh, Steve? All good, thank you. Good. And I, can I quote you on the fact that analog device is using scan code? Yeah, what the hell? Okay, uh, I'll, I'll I'll start a web page where we can put put that on the project. That would be awesome. 
And so that's that's it on my side. If you if you guys have other questions, otherwise I think we'll we'll be able to call it a day. Uh, Jerry, my 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 answers on SWHID versus package URLs uh, made sense. Good. Yep. Thank yeah. you. you. You'll hear, by the way, uh, very often folks presenting on uh, Omnibore, which is another convention uh, for package code uh, checksums, which is essentially the same as SWHID, by the way. Uh, and, and saying, oh, SWHID is an intrinsic uh, identifier based on the content, and Perl is extrinsic, and that's not exactly true because we're, again, it's entirely based on the content, but the meta content at the metadata level, which is still part of the project. Um, just something that always makes me tick a bit when I, when I hear that. Um, but the, 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 the dark side is that there's a bit more leeway for interpretation that we need to, and some, some loopholes that we need to close so, so it's easier and, and more useful for everyone. Okay, everyone, thank you very much for your time. Um, I think I have, uh, uh, oh, there's one more question. No, great, thank you. Uh, I think I have, uh, uh, I do have uh, sharing and stop sharing, right? So I'll stop the sharing and end the session. And um, I look forward to see you online. And if you want to use the tools, please go do it. They're free and open source. Use the source. Bye, everyone. <laughs>